Well, we're sort of back in lockdown mode, semi-lockdown mode here at least. Um, I, I'm in the sanctuary because it's almost 8 o'clock and the little lamb students get to stay home. They're going to be home for the next few weeks. So I can do a Zoom chapel lesson in a, in a while. I'll change. I'll put on a collar. And um, I don't know. We'll be online this weekend. I'm kind of dour about that. And so when, when I find that I'm dour, I need to, to look back and think on the good times and remember the, the good things that have happened this year and, and all the things that are wonderful about 2020. And, and lo and behold, getting to be back in the sanctuary for this, look what I found. Yeah, it, it's the time I, I beat Jerry Cruz at golf. See, and now my day is bright. That, that's why I keep that scorecard there. And... I think I might be stubborn and try and go out golf tomorrow just because it's going to be 50 in the middle of November in Illinois. When do we get that? So I can socially distance myself on the course, perhaps. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe not. The, the November Masters has given me the itch. So uh, today we are going to be looking at um, more of our Lord's Passion, Matthew 27, verses 11 through 32, and um, also getting into the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. So without any further ado, let's begin our morning devotion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he has commanded, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I do want to point out that you do know a little bit of Hebrew. You know the word for praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallel is praise, and Yah is the, the Lord's name. Praise to the Lord. So, congratulations. You know the first word of Psalm 40, 148 in Hebrew. Hallelujah. Or Hallelujah, if you want to say it that way. I like the huh. Our reading for this morning is Matthew 27, 11 through 32. And this is, again, the passion of our Lord. Now, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, or Jesus, who was called Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, 
He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put, on his, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, while there's much you could talk about with our Lord's crucifixion, I, I do want to point out one thing. One of the verses here that ends up being quite controversial is Pilate washing his hands and the, the crowd, the people saying, his blood be upon us and on our children. And that, uh, that verse has had a, uh, a rather nasty history in the uh, or, uh, interplay in, in history, especially with anti-Semitism, um, where it's been used to justify persecution of Jewish populations. And that misses the point. Um, one of the things that gets emphasized, I think it's in uh, one of the other Gospels, is that the chief priests remain the servants of God, even though they don't know what they're doing. I think it's Luke who does that. I, I could be off. Um, but the, the, they're getting the things right. And, and the point of this is actually, this is really what needs to happen. Um, on the Day of Atonement, you would have the sacrifice, and the blood of the sacrifice would be sprinkled onto the people and their children. And so what you have here is you have the very language of the atoning sacrifice being played out. And so that's the point, that, that even though they don't get what they're doing, this is the atoning sacrifice. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to use John's language. It's all wrapped up there. And so instead of being a, a matter of, oh, look, they're bad and terrible, bad them. No, it's a matter of God's will for the salvation of his people is going to happen, even over and against and in spite of what his people know and expect. So it, it really is a, a, a wonderful statement to this is God's plan. This is... This is dovetailing with what you would see in the Old Testament, all coming together. The entirety of the Old Testament getting condensed and driving right onto here. His blood be upon us and upon his people. These are those who have washed themselves uh, in the blood of the Lamb. They have made themselves white. That, that's, that's the image. That, that is the, the whole theme of the Old Testament. And so this isn't a, a language designed to say, oh yeah, blame the Jews. No, it, it's, look, God's plan of salvation is being accomplished even over and above and through and in spite of people being wicked and not understanding. This is a, a great section of God is in control and there is salvation. And if we want to go and start blaming people, we, we miss it. So <clears throat> um, that, that'll be the, the point I make for the morning. And now we will go on and we'll look at the sixth petition from the Lord's Prayer from the Large Catechism. So, the sixth petition is, lead us not to temptation. We have now heard enough about what toil and labor is needed to keep all that we pray for and to preserve. This, however, is not done without weakness and stumbling. Although we have received forgiveness and a good conscience and are entirely acquitted, Yet our life is of such a nature that we stand today and tomorrow we fall, Isaiah 40. Therefore, even though we are godly now and stand before God with a good conscience, we must pray again that he would not allow us to fall again and yield to trials and temptation. Temptation, however, or as our Saxons in the olden times used to call it, verkurum, is of three kinds, of the flesh, of the world, and of the devil. For we dwell in the flesh and carry the old Adam about our neck. 
He exerts himself and encourages us daily to unchastity, laziness, gluttony, and drunkenness, greed, and deception, to defraud our neighbor and to overcharge him. In short, the old Adam encouraged us to have all kinds of evil lusts, which cling to us by nature, and to which we are moved by the society, the example, and what we hear and see of other people. They often wound and inflame even an innocent heart. Note that. Pay attention to who's trying to inflame you, just in general. If someone's trying to get you upset and agitated, most likely it's not any good. Next comes the world, which offends us in word and deed. It drives us to anger and impatience. In short, there's nothing but hatred and envy, hostility, violence, and wrong, unfaithfulness, vengeance, cursing, railing, slander, pride, and haughtiness, with useless finery, honor, fame, and power. No one is willing to be the least. Everyone desires to sit at the head of the group and to be seen before all. Luke 14, 7-11. Then comes the devil, pushing and provoking in all directions. But he especially agitates matters that concern the conscience and spiritual affairs. He leads us to despise and disregard both God's word and works. He tears us away from faith, hope, and love, and he brings us into misbelief, false security, and stubbornness. Or, on the other hand, he leads us to despair, denial of God, blasphemy, and innumerable other shocking things. These are snares and nets, indeed real fiery darts that are shot like poison into the heart, not by flesh and blood, but by the devil. Reflect on that, thinking about what we see and how society acts around us and how people try to agitate us. This is what is going on. It is spiritual warfare. Paragraph 105. Great and grievous indeed are these dangers and temptations, which every Christian must bear. We bear them even though each one were alone by himself. So every hour that we are in this vile life, we are attacked on all sides, chased and hunted down. We are moved to cry out and to pray that God would not allow us to become weary and faint, and to fall again into sin, shame, and unbelief. For otherwise, it is impossible to overcome even the least temptation. This, then, is what lead us not into temptation means. It refers to times when God gives us power and strength to resist temptation. However, the temptation is not taken away or removed. While we live in the flesh and have the devil around us, no one can escape his temptation and lures. It can only mean that we must endure trials, indeed, be engulfed in them. But we say this prayer so that we may not fall or be drowned in them. To feel temptation is therefore a far different thing from consenting or yielding to it. We must all feel it, though not all in the same way. Some feel it in a greater degree and more severely than others. For example, the young suffer especially after the flesh. Afterwards, when they reach middle life and old age, they feel it from the world. But others who are occupied with spiritual matters, that is, strong Christians, feel it from the devil. Such feeling, as long as it is against our will and we would rather be rid of it, can harm no one. For if we did not feel it, it could not be called a temptation. But we consent to it when we give it the reins and do not resist or pray against it. Therefore, Christians must be armed and daily expect to be constantly attacked. No one may go on in security and carelessly as though the devil were far from us. At all times, we must expect and block his blows. Though I am now chaste, patient, kind, and in firm faith, the devil will this very hour send such an arrow into my heart that I can scarcely stand. For he is an enemy that never stops or becomes tired. So when one temptation stops, there always arise others and fresh ones. So there is no help or comfort except to run here. Take hold of the Lord's Prayer and speak to God from the heart like this. Dear Father, you've asked me to pray. Don't let me fall because of temptation. Then you'll see that temptations must stop and finally confess themselves conquered. If you try to help yourself by your own thoughts and counsel, you will only make the matter worse and give the devil more space. For he has a serpent's head. If it finds an opening in which it can slip, the whole body will follow without stopping. But prayer can prevent him and drive him back. The image I like here, that Luther did not know of, but I think he would have approved of, is the great game of whack-a-mole. We're always fighting off temptations. 
And really, it is rather God who must fight them off for us. And so we rest in him. So, with that being said, how about we... Uh, But we uh, confess the creed and the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll pray and be on our way for the day. So, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon the young children of our land, those in school, especially here in Hersher and its area, as they return to learning at home. We ask that you keep them in the next two weeks, that you would use this time to be a profitable time of learning, that you would give diligence to teachers and students and parents, that they would work together to this endeavor. Bless also our little lambs as they learn from home. Grant that they might uh, be kept from fear and terror, that they might uh, remain hopeful and joyous, and that they might continue to grow in wisdom and in stature. Heavenly Father, be with the doctors and nurses of our land, especially our area. Keep them safe in their comings and goings. Bless our hospital workers. Keep them safe, especially as things become more crowded and hectic. Grant them endurance and strength. Be with those who are suffering from COVID and are ill. Grant to them speedy recoveries, if it is your will. And grant to us all endurance and perspective, that we might use this time to be refocused on your great love and promises to us. Heavenly Father, bless our leaders, our politicians, grant that, that there would be peace and stability and order within our nation, and that, that those who have been elected into office would lead rightly and with wisdom for all. These things and whatever else you know that we need, we lift up to you, trusting the great love that you have for us in your Son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Prayer of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, as the healer of the nations, you released many from their bondage to sin, death, and the devil. But when it came time to release you, the crowd chose a murderer instead. Through our crucifixion with you in the waters of holy baptism, may we continually be released from our sins as we confess you to be our everlasting King. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to excuse me, create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Just as a reminder, uh, we're going to be online this weekend, um, and probably for a little bit while after that, so uh, do be safe. And if you get two down, try to remember, good things have happened this year. It's not all dour. And as an example and a reminder, see, what a great thing. Look, it's when I beat Jerry at golf.
See, my day was brightened just by seeing that. So may you remember many of the good things that have happened to you this year. Ah, the joys of life. All right. Have a good day, everybody.